Hi folks, welcome to Wednesday's edition of the iWrite Radio Podcast, Stroke Videocast. Stuart Lockhead with me today. Um, not, like sure if, <laughs> not sure <laughs> if Jimmy will be joining us. Um, well, Wednesday, obviously, we've got PMQs. We've got our regular look at the uh, Nicola Sturgeon press conference. I've got a wee clip I'd like to show you of... Uh, Philip or Whitford at Scottish Questions, which precedes PMQs, which I think will lead into some discussion about Scottish independence, uh, where we stand and where our, I was going to say enemies, but let's call them opposition unionists stand. So, uh, Stuart, today's press conference. Well, today's press conference followed of course um yesterday's we didn't have a press conference yesterday because the first minister made a report to Holyrood in the chamber and that was about all the the protection level changes i think, I think that's the official title well, everybody's got their own version other people like to call them tears other people like to talk about restrictions what did we find out most of you who are listening or are watching will already know the details of anywhere that you hopefully of where you live i got a couple of things out of it she was asked about bearing in mind it wasn't journalists she was taking questions from she was taking questions from politicians what's happened to the how will the the oh yes and the of course the other excitement yesterday was the, the news about the vaccinations so that had them all worked up. And it's been the same this morning on, the, on, on most of the news channels, even the non-news channels, they're all talking about this, getting excited, which is fair enough. But I think hype, overhyping is bad. Um, flu jag, how will they cope with delivering the, the vaccinations? And well, it's a bit quick. They only just said that there might be one coming in three months time. She was also asked about uh, the row between uh, Dominic Cummings and Whitty about possibly cutting the time of self-isolation and quarantining. Is this yesterday you're talking about? Yeah, this is still yesterday. And she was absolutely insistent. Uh, I'm not listening to Dominic Cummings. There are no plans to move these, the, time, you know, the length of any quarantining or self-isolation. 14 days to 10 or whatever. No plans to do that at all. She was also asked by Willie Rennie, because I'm mentioning this yesterday. Guess what Willie Rennie asked about? Mental health. Testing and students for Christmas. All right. Okay. But his first question was, what did the people of Fife get wrong that they've been moved from level two to level three? And the first minister said, nobody did anything wrong. I don't know what to say. Um, Oh, the other question that the first question that he asked about was the students for Christmas and the first minister said well you'll find out tomorrow afternoon so that's this afternoon which was the main topic of all the, the, the journalists at the press of today one odd question at yesterday's session was Rachel Hamilton posh Tory bird I think she, she might be from the Hamilton family um, she asked about vitamin D were there enough supplies for everybody in care homes and shielding? I need to ask, what's that? I, that Holland and Barrett. On a general point, you know, these caring Tories, you know, she wanted free vitamin D, did she not? Yeah. Handed out. Yeah. But when did they stop being Tories? Oh, no. The Prime Minister was still a Tory. Oh no, the private sector was going to save us from this COVID. This oh. virus. Well, right. Okay. That was yesterday. What about today? Well, then we had the, the, a very, very little on, on the PMQs. I watched the first 15 minutes of it. Um, as I say, I didn't think Keir Starmer was particularly All right. good. Right. Sorry. I'll, I'll, be, I'll finish with it in one sentence. Um, but he did, the Prime Minister did rant about the, the private sector was going to save us from the virus. So that was about all that I noticed. Did you, you, did, did you have anything to say about the Prime Minister? Well, it, it was... Keir, Keir Stammer was in attack mode. 
basically highlighting the various mistakes and has kind of fired the starting gun on what has been all over social media, which is the number of Tory affiliated companies that were getting these uh, contracts that were never put out to tender. Yes, not before time. Um, 150 million to supply masks uh, and exactly zero masks have been supplied by this company. Yeah. Now, I think they're going to get away with this. I, I think the rules allow them to do it the way they're doing it because it's, you know, an emergency. Emergency pledges, yeah. Um, and unless the mainstream media do what they did with the expenses scandal at Westminster, um, this, this is just going to wither and die. I think you're right. I'm absolutely right, Nori. I think you said it's a very important point. So it, need, it needs there needs to be a concerted effort Not from happen, all the opposition parties to attack this element. I mean, it, it's extraordinary the amount of money that's gone to Tory supporters who have companies that are a month old, a couple of months old at most. Yes, and based in council houses in Wellingborough and things. Well, it, it is quite extraordinary. Um, but that was the first question. He then went through a litany of, of other issues. Um, none of it particularly hard hitting. Boris Johnson did what he always does, just didn't answer the question. And then, as you say, jumped on his privatization soapbox, having referred to today's Tory party as One Nation Tories, which I think is hilarious. Um, do what I did. Aye. And then jumped on his soapbox and basically listed all the areas that private companies have made a huge profit and failed to deliver with his usual confidence and bluster. Total waste of time. So didn't he, uh, he, he trumpet how wonderful it was that uh, we now have a vaccine and we're all going to have a big party at Christmas? Didn't he say anything like that? No, nah, well, I, I, I think, I think he maybe he's learned his lesson when it comes to the vaccine. I think he's keeping his horns in, um, but I don't think he's going to start making promises just yet. He'll do the light of the tunnel thing. Um, the COVID, COVID tunnel is no longer as dark. I, I don't want to start making up phrases right. for him in case he uses them. One, um, yeah, I. Starmer's wasn't terribly effective in what he did today. Um, but difficult. did Ian Blackwood get a question at all? Oh, Ian Blackford was... Blackford. It wasn't... Well, let, let me put it this way. He wasn't effective, but he wasn't quite as bad as he has been recently. Um, he seems to have learned the difference between sitting at home and doing a Zoom question and standing up in, in the parliament itself. Was he in the chamber today? No, he was at home. But he he went on, uh, the SNP are now asking for the £20 extra in universal credit to be continued indefinitely, um, which was the reason the Tories never wanted to do it in the first place, because they don't want to do it indefinitely. So... That was one part of the question. His second question was on the three million self-employed that are getting no help at all from the government with the furlough scheme. Why does he have to do that? I mean, there are another 648 MPs that would chase that one because every MP has got some knows, has got a buddy that's self-employed. Well, that's the way he chose to go. Um, totally a ignored, waste of a question. Well, totally ignored the uh, the the comments by the Viceroy for Scotland, Mr. Jack, on a, apparently he's got the right to decide how long a generation is, uh, 25 oh, years yeah. minimum, possibly 40 years. Oh, well. So effectively, if you're over 60 and want to vote on independence, tough titty, you're going to be dead before you get it. I believe you might have a clip for us, Nori. I've got a very good clip of Philippa Whitford, actually, <laughs> that I'm going to show you, that kind of sums things up. 
Here we go. Do, 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 do. Here's Philippa Whitford, uh, Scottish questions, just before PMQs. Last December's general election is once in a generation, but I hope the Secretary of State isn't suggesting there won't be another one for 40 years. He seems to think the way to strengthen the union is by forcing a hard Brexit on Scotland against our will, taking an axe to devolution with the internal market bill and denying any democratic choice on Scotland's future until adults like me are dead. On that basis, does he think the best recipe for a happy marriage is to lock up the wife, take away her checkbook and just keep refusing a divorce? <laughs> no, I... I think it's quite straightforward. I think people should respect democracy, as I have said in my previous question to the member for Perth. We, we are respecting democracy. We are saying we are acknowledging once in a generation. We don't believe Scotland should be thrown onto the uncertainty of never And it's, it's, it's very straightforward. A generation, by any calculation, is 25 years. And, and, and frankly, you, know, you just have to accept that and focus on what matters, which is recovering from this pandemic pandemic and us all pulling together I, I love the fact that um, a generation as far as I know and the only British agreement available to look at that has that time scale is seven that's, years that's for the Northern Irish one yep um, and I'd, I st I'm still stunned I had no idea Alex Salmond and Nicholas Sturgeon making a statement carried so much weight I would have thought Maggie Thatcher's comment about all the SNP have to do if they want Scottish independence is to send a majority of MPs from Scotland to Westminster. Yes, they don't even we don't even need a referendum. Just send a majority of Scottish MPs. That's well, Maggie SNP Thatcher's view. Was yeah. Maggie Thatcher's view? I need to ask her what uh, what she thinks of the current situation. Well, I I can only suggest that Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond get their heads together and come up with a couple of other one-liners. Mm. You know? Well, well it, it, there's no getting away from it. If you repeat something often enough, it doesn't matter whether it's a lie. And don't forget, we're talking about coming from out of the mouth of unionists, and in particular Tories, they specialise in lies. They're very good at lies. Well, the weight that's been given to those two throwaway lines. I, somebody else was quoting that... It, The, the phrase was scattered throughout the white paper. But, well, I can't remember the exact expression it was using. I don't remember it being scattered throughout the white paper. No, no I think it's possible that uh, it was used as an argument. Unfortunately, it was used in the, in the in debate uh, in, the, in the course of the referendum campaign. But don't forget that referendum campaign lasted for two years. You know, can you imagine what <laughs> everything was used in that debate over two years? Well, I, I mean, the last general election was once in a generation, according to Boris Johnson. Oh, that's all right then, because we so, never no more no more elections. Yeah, effectively. Um, but the really annoying thing about it is that our unionist media just take it on board. They they don't question it. You know, I mean, there's been plenty of other, how shall we say, definitions um, like Margaret Thatcher's. Tons of them. There you go. Um, there's plenty of Tories have said, oh, if they win the Holy... I think I'll wear a hat with a headband saying, you know, Maggie Thatcher says majority well, of SNP um, MPs at Westminster, Mid Scotland can have their independence. No I, referendum required. I think as a tactic, we should repeat that. Every time somebody says once in a generation, simply say, well, who's, who, who has more authority in the Tory party, Nicholas Sturgeon or Maggie Thatcher? Because Maggie Thatcher said. Mm -hmm. There you go. Um, what else did we have? Yes, well, we've got, we had a press briefing today. A bit of a come down a bit after the excitement yesterday's changes there were a few there were more changes to in the levels yesterday than i expected i must admit um i, I the, the hard data 
I suppose the fact that there were 64 more dead was a bit shocking, but then again, it's Wednesday, so that presumably covered the, the, the weekend when there was only one on the Sunday. Was it only one on the Sunday? Was I'm, the not, I'm not really sure how It was very low. Uh, it was very low. So that, it, and it, it's the seven day average that matters. Um, I've got a question for you, Nori. What, today was the 11th of the 11th, and at 11 o'clock we remembered the dead of war. What, what do you call it? Remembrance Day or Armistice Day? I tend to call it Remembrance. Well, no, Remembrance Sunday, I suppose. Armistice Day is the 11th, isn't it? I thought it was Armistice Day yeah. it was called. Yeah. Because I, they, they make a big thing of it on a Sunday, don't they? Yeah, yeah. The, the Sunday nearest to it is um, Remembrance, Remembrance Sunday. Sunday yeah. Yeah. It's uh, just curious, because I know that the, the First Minister called it Remembrance Day, and I thought this was Armistice Day, because of the well, 11th. My, the 11th. My wife went up yesterday and put a cross in the ground nice. for, well, my uncle, her uncle, um, and I suppose both our fathers, because they both fought in the war. Yeah. It's the same with all of us. I, 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 my grandfather and his brother were orphans. Um, Army orphans, and so they went to uh, an army school. As did London. my father's father. Um, where was it again? Was it Dunblane? Well, there's, a, uh, there's one at Dunblane. There's also the one in the, uh, my grandfather went to one apparently in London called the Duke of York School. There you go. Yeah, I was a bit surprised to find out how many of my relations of my grandfather and the generation before him were uh, in the British Army. I had a, a career a, a British Army. Great grandfather that he was a professional cricketer and, and he played football for Queen's Park and he was in the army and he fought for uh, Garibaldi for the unification of Italy. He fought for the red shirts. So this is where you get your total lack of sporting ability. And your complete nutty Italian style conspiracy theories. No, no, that's my it's my dress sense you're thinking of. Oh right. <laughs> my dress sense. My Italian suit. That's the Italian peasant look that you like. Uh, well, there you go. I haven't got the haven't got the svelte look anymore. Um, um, what else happened today at the presser? We had I'll, I'll, the last bit I thought was funny. There was a posh bird, Helen Puddick. And what did she ask about? What did she work for? The Times. <laughs> she asked a really odd question, and then suddenly it talked to me. Apparently, uh, the schools in Scotland don't break up until the 22nd of the 23rd of December, just a couple of days before Christmas. Um, is this, is this not a bit unsafe for them? To, you know, they get, and they're all be, they won't, they won't be tested the same as students, apparently. And they'll be rushing home with a virus. And then you're left, the first minister was asking, you could see her, she cast a... Is this a this question about? about boarding schools? Exactly. It took me about a minute to figure it out. It was a posh bird. And it, right. it, the only explanation for the stupid question was she was thinking about kids going home from boarding schools and carrying the virus right. with them. Having had the boarding school brother, it didn't take me quite so long. Uh, well, me too. It's a strange, just shows you. It's hard to tell. What else did you think? You didn't watch the presser. I don't think there's too much no, I didn't, to tell no. you about. I suppose the controversial thing, apart from Aberdeen, Council is mo is grieving against. So we had a few questions about why is the, why is the, the, the local authority I'm living in working in not in a better level? Uh, it, was, it was a bit like Holyrood yesterday. You know why are why is my constituency in the wrong level? We've got a bit of that. And HAI was another issue. Hosp the, the Sun are trying to build up something about that. Hospital acquired infections, but the first minister really had the answer to that. She said, "Look, when I was health minister, we had a, it was a big issue for us, especially C diff, 
and you can never eradicate infections from a hospital. Yeah, yeah. By its very nature, you bring people who are infected in there to be de-infected. Is that a word? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I predicted this, Stuart, that one of the fallouts from the five levels was always going to be the argument about who should be in what level, how you calculate what level is applicable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and because, because it isn't an algorithm, because you can't punch all the information into a machine, press a button and get your level punted out, it's going to be div divisive, you know. And they ask our own Jimmy is not happy about Edinburgh being in level three. Yeah. But it's not just about the numbers. Well, look, I, when I heard the question by the Fife a presume, uh, um, journalist, presumably it was from King. Oh, yeah, it was <laughs> Kingdom FM, right. the Fife radio station. And uh, the answer was very polite in the, the, by Jason Leach. He was on, so he's always, he's our the first minister's shield. He's always got a better answer than any of the journalists. And he called it containment. This was the other issue, apart from the, the hard data that, you, that everybody can read on their own. It's containment. And I just keep waiting for them to say, have you looked at the number of people that cross that fourth bridge to work in Edinburgh every day? <laughs> you know, the, when you think about people moving backwards and forwards. With, yeah, with the, but as, as we have discovered in spades since these daily press conferences started, this is not about information gathering. It's not about the newspapers disseminating information to the public. It's about finding a way to attack the Scottish government. That's, SMP bad. that's all it's about, you know, and as far as they're concerned, well and good if the public get informed by mistake accurately of something. I know I noticed today there's there's been a glitch in the Scottish track and trace app that's been reporting numbers wrong. So. No, I, 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 as far as the, I gathered from the, the First Minister and uh, Jason Leach, there ain't a problem with the app. It's just people are leaving them switched on in lockers, in, a, in their bag, in the staff room, in places where they, they shouldn't be left switched on. Even if, you, if you're not with it, it's no, it's no good. If you're not well, this, this has to do with how soon people are traced. Apparently, it's not within 24 hours. It can take up to 72 hours. Oh, no, we had a detailed explanation of that. Very detailed um, breakdown of the data. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that. I'll, I'll say so that I can was I, convinced. I was convinced. With can the I presume that this glitch has been, as I kind of suspected it would have been, exaggerated? Yes, as far as I can see, there's no, there's no right. story. Oh, there's always a story, Stuart. <laughs> the tabloid hacks, what do you expect? Well, even the ones that aren't tend to act like they are. Can I point out that whatever, however bad it seems here just now, over in Northern Ireland, they've ha they have just come to the end of four weeks of complete lockdown. No pubs, no nothing, right? But no schools and everything closed. And they still haven't decided whether they're going to extend it by another couple of weeks. And it's not Sinn Féin versus the DUP. The DUP have fallen out with the you know, Ulster Unionists. Well, I I mean, I've, I've been keeping not a close eye, but I've been dipping into the Northern Ireland figures. And I don't know what happened, but they were doing really, really well. And then there was an explosion of cases. They, they must be really stumped. I mean, I'd, I'd like to know how it happened because from their very, very low figures, I mean, they were the, the best in the, in the UK as a whole for a long, long time. And now uh, that there must be nearly, well, they'll be second worst after England, if not worse. Well, they've got uh, a political a row going on there. I don't, they may have solved it by now, um, but this was last night's midnight news, I think. Still uh, having a, they've broken up the politicians 
in Stormont falling out about a two week extension of the lockdown. Is this what they're arguing about? Yeah. Well, I, if, if, if like us, they've managed to make it plateau, great. But I, I think the next question for Sturgeon is going to be, does she push the central belt into level four to try and get the numbers falling before Christmas? I, I, I would imagine that has been seriously discussed. Well, the figures, depending on where you look at it, but the figures for Edinburgh and the Lothians, it's West Lothian looks, West Lothian looks bad. And so does Glasgow in its immediate environment. But uh, Edinburgh and East Lothian looks all right. Well, will we take a wee trip over the pond for a minute? Um, what, the Atlantic? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did you see the clip of Mike Pompeo uh, assuring everybody there would be a smooth transition to a Trump presidency? A Trump presidency? Yeah, yeah. I, I thought I th he already was the president. Well, I was. he was being interviewed by, I think it was Fox News. And the question was, will there be a smooth transition? And he turned around and went, oh, yes, there will definitely be a truth, a smooth transmission heartbeat to a Trump presidency. So That's Trump not a is, transition. No, but I think he was um, Being using the words transition, I, I, smooth transition. I think everybody thought he was about to let the cat out of the bag um, and he turned the tables. But at the moment, Mr. Trump is busy firing everybody in charge of the Army, Navy and Air Force. I know. I can't figure that one out. What, what does that mean? He's it firing means, all the civilian bosses. So he can put his own people in there, which makes you wonder why he wants control of the Armed Forces of America. Hmm. That's a good question. Why I could that like possibly be? Yeah. I can't. I can't see the generals and admirals, etc., being pushed into that position because they swear allegiance to the Constitution. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. So they have an out, if you like. Um, they they can refuse to obey the what do they call him? And I don't know. Who, uh, it's an expression they use. Um, he's the, the boss of the armed forces. Um, well, there was it. a there was a story that when he first took over, that they actually with the issued fake codes, the codes for launching a nuclear <laughs> strike on anybody. The, there was a story that the military actually issued him with fake codes in case he was stupid enough to. In case he decided just to try it out and see if it worked. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know, but I, I can't, I couldn't see the, the hierarchy of the Army, Navy, Air Force allowing him to utilize um, American forces on American soil. In fact, I think it might be against the Constitution. To They've got the National American Guard. Force. I don't understand. I, I don't know, don't understand their status. And they're I'm, they're a volunteer force. Yes, but are they, are they part they're of the Dad's army. army. Well, they're part of the territorials or something. Yeah, that kind of thing. But they're they're on a different level to uh, to the full time forces. Then you've got all the militias as well, because everybody's allowed to have a. Uh, but the only the only qualification for being in a militia is having a hole drilled in your head, and your brain sucked out. Yes. Mm. But uh, I I can't see an end to this in America, um, and I'm not sure what the ramifications. You really think that it's uh, it will be for us? You think it's still a dangerous situation there? 
I do, I do, because maybe not so much as be, because I think he'll get away with it, but there has to be ramifications if he tries it. If he tries to do something like mobilise the armed forces, he has to go to jail for that. And if he gets indicted for it, his supporters are not going to like it. So, you know, I, I think there's still a road to run on this one. And I, can't, I just, I mean, we need, we need, the Americans need the Republicans to come out and support their democracy. And they need to do it soon and in numbers. I thought there was enough of them already. But like, there's, I don't even know that it's a handful have accepted the result. Well, the polls that I've seen, the, the, the vast majority of the people of America have accepted the result. Down to about less than 15% have gone with Trump's case version. And how many million is 15%? And don't forget, only a third, only two thirds of the eligible voters voted. There were 60 or 70 million people didn't that could have voted that didn't vote. Uh, well, how many millions is 15%? And you can bet your bottom dollar that 15% will have more than one gun in the cupboard. Yeah, well. And that that could be a problem. That I think he's I think he needs to be dragged out kicking and screaming and put in a straitjacket. But there yes, well, go. we thought that before he even went in there. That's true as well. <laughs> I mean, we, the people of Scotland formed their opinion about him when he was just building a golf course, let alone running a country. Well, the way he treated that guy up in Aberdeen, where he built the, the earthen, earthen works around his farm, uh, um, absolutely horrendous way to treat anybody. Yeah. Um, and the old lady, who they, they built fences so she couldn't yeah. see the sea anymore, and cut off the water supply and I mean go I mean that's what a gangster does stole land yeah stole land yeah um right anything to finish with sure anything catch your eye particularly today uh, I suppose I don't like the way Alan Smith who's a very important um member of the SNP hierarchy because he's he was MEP and for he was in M, he was our representative at uh, the European Parliament for years and I don't like the way he keeps writing stories and moaning here Alan Smith has hit out at the SNP Women's Pledge and Commonweal groups accusing them of crossing a line in the party's recent selection co contest he's complaining that there is there is wrong for groups to run a slate of can candidates asking voters to pick only those hopefuls who had signed up to their respective commitments I mean, that's the pot calling the kettle black. I, 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 I had to really think about this. How else do you get your agenda front and centre if you don't advertise to people that the people that support you are standing for election? Are you supposed to keep silent about it? I mean, I, I don't get this. Are there, are there candidates who agree with you not to be promoted. I mean, surely that's the whole point of democracy. People get a choice. It's very strange. He's He's been out and about a bit recently as well. He was on oh, one of the podcasts I listened to. Has he not, he, got, a, has he not got a notorious boyfriend? I'm not sure they're still together, but yeah, he had, he's got a very woke Who, boyfriend. Who's got very bad reputation on social media. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure if he had any job in the party or anything, but um, he was definitely on the wokiest of woke sides. Mm. And said a few things that he had to apologize for and retract Leah. But I, I, I suppose I, what worries me is that he's allowed, Alan Smith's allowed to say, oh, the other side are all bad because they uh, don't, I don't agree with them and they're causing division. 
And he's allowed to say there's division, winding it all up. Where's the, I, I'm a bit bothered that he, he gets to write his own story and he says, what the National do? And then a, 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 a National journalist writes a story about his story. So there's two stories in the National saying the same thing. Well, yeah, but it, it's the argument that he gets that platform and people that disagree with the party line don't get a platform. That's yeah, wrong. But, but why did the National, you know, he gets up, gets, Alan Smith gets to write his own story and then they get a journalist to write a story about his story. So he gets double exposure. Yeah, but that, and then to, to complain about people getting exposure. That's the problem <laughs> for me because... If you have to fight for exposure because you're not part of the mainstream or the hierarchy that has the ability to be printed and talked about in the national, you know, you have to take other routes. And if one of those routes is to go to the membership and say, this candidate agrees with our policy on X, Y, Z, please support him. Or if you're lucky enough, powerful enough to have a list of candidates, you can say that about why should you not be allowed to do that? You know, well, I mean, uh, apparently um, some of these candidates were actually picked and uh, the people like Ash Denham, John McAlpine, Christine Graham and Stuart McMillan. I didn't realise these were contentious people. Not sure well, if I agree with Stuart McK McK McMillan's. Is it? No, no. Stuart, Stuart McMillan's all on it. I keep getting him muddled up with Stuart McDonald and his attitude to defence. Well, um, John McAlpine has been well attacked by the woke of the party. I mean, they tried to get her deselected at one point, did they not? As they did with Joanna Cherry. You know, so, I mean, if the people Alan disapproves of, start trying to get sitting MPs and MSPs deselected, and maybe he'll have an argument. Until that happens, maybe he should just have a look at his own side and what they get up to. Well, that's my point. You know, um, but I'd, it's hypocrisy as far as I'm concerned that he gets such a prominent platform to complain about people with a much less prominent platform managing to find a platform it's just nonsense it's a democracy everybody it would be nice although totally unrealistic but it would be nice if every side of every argument got the same platform yeah. you get to make up your own mind <laughs> but they don't want you to make up your own mind they want to make up your mind for you oh no don't make go there did, no, did, I, let I, me I, talk about the, what was it, the number of proxy votes that MPs have uh, signed up for in Westminster. We'll cover that. More in than day. half of Tory votes at Westminster are sitting on the desk of the Tory whips. So they don't need to be there. They, they have don't need to access. Go and, and they don't get to, they don't, they don't make up their own minds. They've already said whatever the party says. But unfortunately, it, it, there's a quite a lot of, um, I had a look at the list and I haven't added them up yet. It's the same, similar situation with the SNP. But the SNP have been arguing that remote voting, virtual voting should be allowed. They at least have attempted to return the right of the vote to the individual. Uh, that's fair enough. Uh, remember, this is the Tory party that instituted the present system. Having had an ability to vote remotely taken away. Mm. And guess who that was? Mr. Rhys Mogg. Yeah. That well known figure of the 15th century. Yeah, and the friend of Steve Bannon. Exactly. Anyway, enough of that good news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we'll call it a day at that. Yeah. Um, thanks for being with me, Stuart. Thank you, uh, Nori. And we'll catch up with you all tomorrow. Thanks for listening, folks. Um, and I've no doubt there'll be another vaccine on the way soon. You'll have choices. Cheers for now, folks. <laughs>